I'll read the panel description that we circulated to our speakers, and then I'll introduce them into our initial speaking. In the 1970s, much of the new left adopted a perspective that would later become to known as the rank and file strategy. Amidst this turn to industry, socialists proletarianize themselves by seeking employment in strategic working class industries in order to help facilitate a turn towards independent class politics. Now, 50 years later, the rank and file strategy is experiencing resurgence under change conditions among a new generation of millennial and Generation Z leadership. However, the parallels between the 1920s, or between the 2020s and the 1970s have emerged without much reflection on the similarities and differences. How does the original articulation of the rank and file union strategy compare to the contemporary revival? What is motivating the return of this labor strategy? Are the prospects for such a strategy more favorable today or less, and why? What lessons should be drawn from the past 50 years regarding the relationship between labor movement organizing and socialist politics? So our first speaker will be Naomi Crane. Naomi is the organizer of the Socialist Workers Party branch in Chicago. She is a freight, a freight rail conductor and member of the Sheet Metal, Air, Rail, and Transportation Union. You may have heard about this union recently in regards to the rail strikes, or potential rail strikes. Crane has been active in the labor movement for over 30 years, including in the garment, textile, and meatpacking industries. She is a former editor of the Militant Newspaper. Luke Pickrell is a member of the Marxist Unity Group, a faction in the Democratic Socialists of America, working to transform the DSA into an independent socialist party by arguing for internal democracy, programmatic unity, and electoral discipline. Jack Metzger is Professor Emeritus of Humanities at Roosevelt University here in Chicago. His research interests include labor politics, working class voting patterns, working class culture, and popular and political discourse of class. He is a former president of the Working Class Studies Association and a member of the Chicago Center for Working Class Studies. His most recent book, released in 2021, is titled Bridging the Divide, Working Class Culture in a Middle Class Society. Outside of the classroom, Metzger was a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. You're going to reveal that? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Richard DeVries is a longtime organizer and activist on the left. He spent time in the 1970s in Nicaragua aiding the Sandinistas. Then he traveled to Spain following Franco's death to support reopening the National Confederation of Labor. In the 90s, DeVries joined the Teamsters Local 705, where he has been for nearly 30 years. He played an active role in the 1997 UPS strike and has offered labor help to other causes, notably Amazon's recent organizing drive. He's a contributor to Labor Notes Journal and a regular presenter at conventions of Teamsters for a Democratic Union. He has taught at the AFL-CIO Rocky Mountain Labor School and the DePaul University School for New Learning. So our, our first speaker will be Naomi. <coughs> Okay, well, th thank you for the invitation. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was able to visit East Palestine, Ohio, where myself and other members of the Socialist Workers Party uh, uh, talked to, 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 to residents door to door and in a couple of the blocks right, right near the rail tracks where uh, the uh, big derailment happened, I'm sure people are aware of, at the beginning of February, um, and, you know, and visited other working people in the town. Um, the discussion in the wake of that, that train disaster and the burn off of the toxic chemicals poses a number of important questions. The fight by workers and farmers and others in the area to control the conditions of the cleanup, which they, they did win a, a, a small initial victory in forcing the Norfolk Southern to actually tear up and remove you know, millions of tons of uh, uh, contaminated soil from under the railroad tracks instead of their original plan just run the trains again as, as fast as possible. 
it's connected to the fight of rail workers uh, that you know came to kind of national attention last year against against job cuts, um, longer and heavier trains, and and grueling work schedules. Uh, a fight in which, as people here are aware, we're, we're up against both the bosses and the government. Um, the fact that they, the, one of the only things that could bipartisan, there was bipartisan agreement on last year was to shut down any possibility of a strike by rail workers uh, gives an indication of the fear that the ruling class has of, of the working class and its, its power. And this was bipartisan from, so I think was mentioned yesterday, from Ocasio-Cortez to, to, to the right wing. Um, the, 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 the fight over the last year and the, and the, and, and the recent disaster, just, there was just another one in Minnesota a couple days ago, um, show why we need to use union power uh, to, to control conditions of work and production uh, and not look to, you know, why we can't look to the government or any of its agencies uh, or any of its wings to, uh, to defend our, our interests. I strongly recommend the, the coverage in the militant newspaper around this and other fights um, and, and around the solidarity that's been shown uh, uh, by working people all over in the face of this disaster, uh, um, you know, which is, highlights the fact that the working class is not only the producers of wealth, uh, but also the bearers of solidarity and the, the, those, those capable of bearing solidarity and, 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 and a different kind of uh, uh, morality than the dog-eat-dog -dog morality that capitalism uh, uh, perpetuates. Um, What's happening on the railroads highlights the character of the capitalist assault on the working class uh, uh, nationally and internationally. And you know, the, we're, we're deeply affected by the, the, the growing economic instability, the, the wars that are happening, and the social and moral crises that come along with that from you know, inflation to drug addiction, suicide rates, many others that I won't go into. But th th those are the conditions that are fueling the increase in working class and labor resistance that we see today. And the fact that among working people there is more distrust and disgust for all of the bourgeois parties and their representatives than um, at any time in recent history. The Socialist Workers' Party, since its founding, has understood the need for a proletarian party, a party that's working class not only in its program, but also in its composition and activity. Um, you know, that, that wasn't a revelation in the 1970s. That was part of um, you know, our founding uh, uh, program and was rapidly proven to be the case uh, uh, in the face of the pressures uh, 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 as World War II was approaching where there was a layer uh, you know, that was in the Socialist Workers' Party that had, many of had come out of the old Socialist Party um, who sort of functioned in a petty bourgeois milieu. That was their life and existence. And those were the ones who, who capitulated to the pressures of US imperialism as it was headed towards entry into World War II. The proletarian majority of the party was able to maintain a course um, you know, of opposing imperialism's war, explaining the need for working class to take power, explain that it's only the, by the working class in, in each of our countries defeating our own bourgeoisie that we were going to be able to put a stop to these wars, put a stop to the, the horrors of fascism in Europe and, and, and so forth. Um, and we've taken every opportunity since then to, you know, and, and, uh, to, to, to function in the trade unions, in, in the working class. It's, it's part of what we need to do. You see today why it's necessary uh, in relation to the petty bourgeois panic over, over Trump over the last, uh, uh, whatever, it's about eight years. Um, the Socialist Workers Party, from our experience at work and also immersed in activity in the working class, in taking our program door to door in rural areas and cities, towns, um, we knew that what was what Trump was tapping into wasn't, wasn't something reactionary, wasn't, wasn't a wave of white supremacy or many of the other things that were being said. Uh, we knew it was this, this reaction against what both the Democrats and the Republicans have been involved in and, and the deepening assaults in, on our w wages, working conditions, living standards, and, and much more over, over literally decades. Um, <coughs> 
we discussed with workers on their doorsteps, at, at, at rallies, and everywhere else, whoever they voted for, why we needed a class break from, from, from the ruling class and all of their, their parties. Where there was no lesser evil for the working class between Trump and Clinton or Trump and Biden um, or Brandon Johnson and Paul Ballas in the election that's about to happen here today, you know, in Chicago. Um, we talked about why, why working class, why we need to build our, a labor party, our own party based on the unions that can, and, and, and connect that discussion to why we need to find the, a road towards the working class taking, taking power. Um, you know, it, it, it's a road, and you, 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 you find that road in the, course of, in the course of the struggle, but we have to start with functioning and, and acting independent of the bosses and all of their parties and their different wings. Um, the biggest challenge for the working class today is to see our own strength and capacities. And, and this isn't like an intellectual exercise. It's something that comes through experiences, through the different fights that we go through. Members of the Socialist Workers Party uh, work to build uh, and strengthen the unions that we're in and, and other unions that, 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 that go, into, go into struggle. Uh, we build solidarity, which is, you know, it's kind of an elemental exercise, you know, it's, it's, it's how you gain experience and practice and, you know, by building solidarity with, with, with somebody's fight, it, it, it's how you learn to fight yourself. Um, we work in the unions as they are, with our fire on the bosses. Um, we argue against the class collaborationist course that dominates the labor officialdom in this country, but we don't have the idea that you know, and we, the, our, our, our enemy is not the labor officials. Our enemy is the bosses and their whole system and their government. Um, and it's through organizing and fighting for a class struggle course against the bosses that we have the possibility to transform and change the unions into the fight, kind of fighting instruments that they're capable of being. Um, you know, as opposed to organ, you know, focusing on opposition caucuses or organizing like um, at different points it's been called dual unionism or red trade unionism, organizing a, a more political militant union that's going, but that but that functions largely outside the existing labor movement where, you know, as as small as it is today, it's still millions and millions of workers. It's still the largest working class organizations we've got, and the a new rise in and strengthening of the unions is not going to go around the existing unions. We'll see how exactly it develops. We don't have a scheme, but you know, our starting point has to be, you know, there. Um, the activity in and building unions is essential to building a proletarian party. But it's not the beginning or the end of our activity. Um, we take up the broadest uh, uh, political questions, the fights against imperialism and its wars, uh, against every assault on, on rights. You know, one of the things we think is at the center of the class struggle today is the, the, the attacks on constitutional rights that are coming down. Um, to join in every fight against racism, police brutality, attacks on women's rights, and so forth. And we do this on the job among our coworkers and uh, uh, and more, take it broadly, in the working class. We use every example of uh, struggle to, you know, an, an, an issue that comes up to point to the need to overthrow the dictatorship of capital, to bring to power a government of workers and farmers. We can't hothouse when that happens. We can't, we can't hothouse the class struggle or, you know, you can't will a much bigger struggle or movement into being. Um, the, the, the historic crisis that capitalism is in today is provoking and will provoke more resistance. I mean, what the other day, Roy Landerson presented uh, the book, the, uh, the Low Point of Labor Resistance is Behind Us. We think that's true. There's much bigger battles that are coming, and, and, uh, but we, we, you, know, you can't say exactly when, and the opportunities that will come. But as these struggles unfold, having a party that's rooted in the working class is absolutely necessary in order in the course of those battles to forge the kind of broader working class leadership that's going to be needed to lead on the road to power. And I'll just conclude by saying, um, you know, I think being part of such a struggle, whatever exactly happens in each of our own lifetimes, is the most meaningful and useful life you can have. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Our next speaker.
speaker is Steve Pickwell. Thank you. I've committed the ultimate sin, which is not printing out your notes prior to <laughs> coming to an event. So if I'm glancing down at my lap, it's because I'm, you know, trying to, you know, look at my computer a little bit. Um, so, you know, where I'm approaching this, and I think where I was asked to kind of approach this, is through the lens of, you know, the DSA in 2023, uh, the Marxist Unity Group uh, in the DSA, and then the rank and file strategy as folks who are in the DSA are probably encountering the rank and file strategy. Um, there's you know, a long tradition of the rank and file strategy, but I think when folks in the DSA encounter it, they're encountering it in a certain way, you know, through a certain history, through a kind of a, a select group of texts with a certain theory in mind, um, and Mug is kind of interacting with that. So that's kind of the lens I'm, I'm looking at this through. Um, so I'm going to hopefully present on all that, and then I'm going to add a little caveat on the end about you know this idea of well this is Mugs you know take on the rank and file strategy. There's a little caveat to that. Um, so the rank and file strategy, you know, as, as theorized by the uh, by DSA and Tempest Collective Caucus member Kim Moody, um, is based on decades of labor work starting in the 70s, and congealed into an article that's that's published online in 2000. Find it online. It became an official part of the DSA's labor work in 2017. It was, you know, reiterated again in, in 2018 during the the red wave of the teachers strikes. That was my introduction to kind of the labor movement, where you know, and all these teachers were going on strike. Um, and it was given additional resources after the the 2019 DSA convention. It was kind of formalized. Packets were developed. Lesson plans buttons, graphics, you know, a whole kind of infrastructure was developed around it. And it's remained, uh, you know, the dominant labor strategy in the DSA as folks have kind of oriented towards Amazon, Starbucks, and, and UPS. You know, you go on to the DSA's uh, National Labor Committee website and, you know, you'll see kind of the three areas that, that the DSA is trying to hit kind of using the rank and file strategy. Members are encouraged to get rank and file jobs in you know, what are referred to as key industries uh, through a jobs pipeline. That is something that the DSA has, you can do it in the DSA in Chicago, a jobs pipeline. They'll help you get a job in these industries. The general idea is that the socialist movement, you know, I think, needs to be connected to the working class and that the labor movement kind of needs something of a jump start that socialists can provide. I think that's you know, part of the idea behind, behind what's going on here. So I have, you know, I was thinking about this. I have two kind of anecdotes, I think, that have some relevance to the question of, you know, the rank and file strategy, Kim Moody, his projects in general, and then, and then the labor work in the DSA. And I think, you know, where there are some things that can be added. So the first is, is a DSA political education event that I went to on socialism and the environment. And we were having a discussion about, you know, the importance of unions engaging not in what's often called business unionism, but instead practicing kind of an orientation that takes account of larger community issues. So, you know, a good example is when the, the teachers in Chicago, the CTU, uh, put in their demands uh, affordable housing, you know, because affordable housing will support students and their families. That is, you know, lo and behold, obviously, an issue that teachers should care about. Um, so then in the context of global warming, it's argued that unions should champion demands related to climate change. And so the example that was given was uh, SCIU Local 1021 supporting a campaign to divest uh, the San Francisco pension plan from fossil fuels uh, and to stop a new coal shipping terminal in Oakland. And <clears throat> this is all well and good, and but I'm kind of looking at this though through my lens and I'm saying, you know, what doesn't come up in the conversation is what unions can't do. Um, because they can't determine the general flow of the economy on the level necessary to move us away from climate disaster. This kind of seems like a perfect example um, where you're missing a conversation on political power. That just doesn't come up. It kind of remains focused on this one level. And when you're talking about political power, then you're talking about the necessity of, of a socialist political party. You're talking about the undemocratic nature of the existing state and the Constitution that makes it immensely difficult, if not impossible, for the majority of folks to actually have a say in politics. You can pretty easily draw that through line. 
So tackling climate change requires state power and international coordination. We can then ask ourselves, is the existing government going to do that? Will it change? You know, just if we elect someone new, why wouldn't it? Should our constitution have something about the environment in it? Maybe it should. Great, let's change our constitution. Ah, it's super hard to change our constitution. You know, stuff like that. So does the rank and file strategy encourage this line of thinking and conversation as laid out by Kim Moody? I don't really know it does. There's nothing in the document itself that says, you know, you can't have these conversations. But you kind of have to think, you know, as it's laid out, will it kind of lead folks in that direction? And I think it's an important direction. And it's interesting, too, because Kim Moody himself, he acknowledges the importance of politics. Um, he says, you know, virtually every issue facing socialists and the working class people in American society confronts them in the workplace. He's, he's, right, he's a very smart guy. Um, so he acknowledges these things, and the question is, does it come out in the rank and file strategy that the DSA and socialists are interacting with? So my second experience then is with the Labor Notes Conference in, in 2022 here in Chicago. Um, you know, the Labor Notes is, is referred to as one of these transitional organizations. This is a term Moody used. Um, and I think it's one of the most successful, you know, and, I, and he says that as well, maybe besides this, the, the TDU, in the sense that it still exists and it draws a lot of folks to it. Um, you know, there were some critiques of the conference last year based around masks and pronoun badges and whatnot. But to me, that's kind of entirely uninteresting, and I think it kind of misses the mark. Um, I think what's more interesting about Labor Notes is kind of the lack of politics. Um, where it's not really the lack of politics, because there isn't ever really a, a lack of politics. There's only either the dominant political ideology or some ideology kind of pushing back against that. Um, so, you know, Bernie Sanders comes to Labor Notes. He gets a lot of applause. Um, I've also heard, and you know, I note here I don't like making arguments based on hearsay, but I've heard it's hard to get a panel sponsored at Labor Notes about a, a explicitly political issue, right? Something related to politics, so to speak. Um, you know, it's interesting because to his credit, Moody also has something to say about the Democratic Party, though, you know, again, it's not in the original rank and file document. And he, he writes, you know, the rank and file strategy um, and an orientation towards the Democratic Party, it's incompatible. Right? It's, a concert, it's a contradiction to break from an undemocratic union structure and an unaccountable union bureaucracy while you remain subordinated to undemocratic political structures and unaccountable politicians. Right? M Moody acknowledges this. I don't think that the DSA has acknowledged that. And yet they practice something called the rank and file strategy. So lots of things about, you know, labor notes are very good. It's, it's, it's you know, lots of nuts and bolts. It's very practical. There isn't really a lot about socialism, to be my critique, you know, let alone socialism and independent politics. And Moody again admits this. He, you know, he writes that independent political action is not yet an integral part of the program, or that in 2016. And that when choices had to be made between educating and practical strategies and actions on the one hand, and advanced political education or mere propaganda on the other, for better or for worse, we almost invariably chose the former. That was the right choice and part of what made the project to work as well as it did. All right, so I'm not saying, ah, he should have done X, Y, and Z. He chose something and it made this thing work. What I'm critiquing then is what is this thing and how are socialists using it? So Moody's honest on another point, and though again, it's not in the original rank and file document, when he says that if the DSA is to have successful political work in the unions, it will need to develop structures for democratic, collective discussion and decision making on strategy and tactics. And Moody continues, DSA's current labor commission is not sufficiently rooted in members day to day organizing to play this role. And he's absolutely right. Right? The DSA is currently not democratic enough. Oh, I'm very sorry. Thank you. And its NLC is not strong enough to lead the next labor upsurge in this country. And, you know, as Naomi has pointed out, these things will come, right? The question is, is the DSA in a position to lead these things? You know, I'd say more importantly, it's not clear that the DSA's existing leadership even aspires towards those ends, right? It's one thing if you're facing a problem and you're working towards it. I, this is obvious. It's another thing if you're facing a problem and you're not even, you know, trying to deal with it. 
So I'll wrap up here. So the preamble to the DSA's political platform, which was adopted in 2021, it states that the DSA is fighting to win a world organized by and for the vast majority of the working class. The question though, and, and this is what Mug I think tries to ask is, um, what is the reason for existence of the DSA? What is the reason for existence of its rank and file strategy? And so I'm quoting here from our, you know, our labor strategy position paper, and I'll quote for a little bit here. Thus far, conversations around DSA's orientation to labor work have been confined to the realm of strategy and tactics. That is, we regularly debate the merits of the rank and file strategy and periodically debate specific questions of how to engage with this or that labor struggle as each develops. The question of DSA's labor policy, or the why to the direct the how, has been completely ignored. Is our labor work meant to prepare the working class to overthrow the government established by the US Constitution and build a new socialist order? Or is it meant to prepare the working class to ally with progressive politicians and extract concessions from the imperial police state? In other words, will DSA pursue a position of revolutionary labor policy or a reformist one? So I know I've gone a little bit over time. I have a little bit more written down. Um, but that's the question, right, that needs to be asked when we're doing our labor work, right, is what is this for? What direction is we're going? You know, are we going in? And then that's the same direction, of course, that the DSA needs to access itself. Thank you. Do I use this one? Um, I was around in the 1970s, um, and in the early to mid-1970s, hundreds, maybe more, of revolutionary students, and that's what I'm going to call them, revolutionary students, uh, went into and were sent into mills, factories, po the post office, the telephone company, which Kim Moody actually was a, one of those schools to bore from within. Some of the people involved were from the revolutionary communist, very few communist party people that I, at least that I knew. Revolutionary communist party, it split a revolutionary union, um, the SWP, the Socialist Workers Party, um, Progressive Labor, International Socialists, um, and DSA, much less so, uh, DSA mostly went in as union staff rather than as workers in particular places. I don't know that that's still true today. Um, I didn't get to know these student revolutionaries uh, until, until the 1980s. And I got to know them through my involvement in union struggles against contract concessions and plant closings. The wave of deindustrialization that began to occur in the 1980s in the 1980s. As the editor of a journal called Labor Research Review, from 1982 into the 1990s, I was well placed to observe and participate in a wide range of these struggles across the country. Two points I'd like to make about these student revolutionaries. One, I was not one of them. I was observing them after, in the, in the 1980s. They were effective and had a, oh, I'm sorry, uh, they were effective <clears throat> and had a greater impact than is generally known. That's one point I want to make. The other is that now in their 70s, as Moody is, um, as I am, they can look back on lives that were fulfilling and mostly happy, lives that they can be proud of and happy with. And I think that's an important point for younger people today. Um, okay, they were effective. You know, things are much worse than they were in the 1970s. 1970s, you had a very powerful labor movement, uh, and the working class had, by and large, better working conditions and living standards than they have today. It's complicated to measure, measure that, but one thing is for sure, the trajectory, that is, where the working class was going, was much better than than it is today, as, the, as conditions continue to, to deteriorate. So you could say that they, the student revolutionaries didn't have much impact. Um, in every plant closing fight, every anti-concessions uh, contract, 
contract concessions fight that I w witnessed or w participated in, in every one of them, and I'm talking dozens, at the heart of it was one of these student revolutionaries who had been or were still in the Revolutionary Communist Party or one of these uh, very often highly sectarian uh, groups. Um, and the campaigns that I witnessed and reported on would not have happened without these individuals or they would not have advanced as far as they did without these individuals. And I want to point out these were not salts. These were young people, mostly, mostly men, but uh, many women as well, from professional middle class families with college educations, sometimes very fancy ones, uh, who chose to be downwardly mobile, to become working class, to live as a worker among workers, to exist within working class culture, and to bring their middle class cultural capital to a specific group of workers. That may sound paternalistic, and they may have started off that way, I don't know. But by the time I knew them, they were all... Are you talking to Michael? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, by the time I knew them, they were all seasoned workers at various levels of leadership in the workplace and in unions. Very often they were in opposition to the union leadership, but sometimes they were part of that uh, leadership by that time. Most of the struggles that they were engaged in were not successful. And even those that were successful didn't last very long, and by very long I mean more than five years. Um, and they certainly were not transformative in the way that all of us were hoping for uh, in the 80s, when it did appear that there were revolutionary conditions. But from 1982 to 1985, these student revolutionaries Hundreds of people now I'm talking are the people who invented, reinvented, or revived a wide array of tactics and strategies that were eventually adopted by the new voice AFL-CIO in 1995, and many of which we take for granted today. Though we have a much smaller labor movement than we had in the 70s, we have a more dynamic labor movement than we had then. Tiny, <laughs> but more dynamic. And you may have trouble believing that, but that is the case. Um, some of the tactics and strategies they developed were labor community coalitions, standard fare nowadays, but not coming in to the 80s. Corporate campaigns and capital strategies, implant strategies, labor-led industrial policy using eminent domain and public ownership, which we almost did here in Chicago. Uh, worker ownership, worker community ownership, Mondragon style cooperatives, uh, a turn toward broader politics, especially local, I'm talking electoral politics, uh, and above all, internal organizing and the organizing model within unions and the broad diffusion of organizing skills and organizing attitudes. And by organizing attitude, I mean the, the sense that objective conditions can be changed by organizing people for collective, for collective action. That was not something that was widespread in the labor movement going into the 1980s. Though none of these strat st strategies and tactics have proven to be a magic bullet, we would have a much weaker labor movement today without these tactics, and especially the diffusion of the general attitude toward organizing. In the process, I would argue that these student revolutionaries had impacts on thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of workers. Things either got better than they w otherwise would have been, or they got less worse than they otherwise would have been. Even if you don't achieve your objectives, you often achieve things by fighting back. You, you always achieve something by fighting uh, by fighting back and fighting back creatively. Okay, the second point I want to make, and I think this is especially relevant for younger people today. You might think, and I think you should think, and admire the sacrifices that these student revolutionaries made and the things they accomplished, however partial and imperfect. But now in their 70s, 
I look at their lives as individuals who turned away from conventional upward mobility, threw their anchor down in the working class, lived as workers, and they are almost all living happily ever after. Though disappointed by the failure of revolution, variously defined, they can look back on creative, fulfilling lives where they, they raised their families and prospered modestly within a fiercely consistent struggle for social justice. They may have been defeated politically, um, and I argue they weren't com <laughs> completely defeated, uh, but they have thrived personally, and that's something I think you should know. Uh, so my conclusions, one, somebody needs to study these folks before they all pass away. They are a very interesting group of people. And um, they're not known. You know, they weren't, they weren't revealing their political orientation as they were working their way uh, uh, within union struggles. But my much larger point is that the left broadly defined is not nearly as weak and inconsequential as it appears. Much of our best work is done out of sight, boring from within, without our political flags flying, mixing it up with working class people who have a variety of political proclivities very different, very different from our own. We don't win overwhelming victories, but we often keep things from getting worse and we lay foundations for future struggles that may be more successful. Plus, you can live a good life trying real hard to do that. Thank you. So I was told to um, try and give you a few lessons from the 1970s. For me, the first lesson came when Muhammad Ali, then Cassius Clay, refused induction into the United States Army. That was a pivotal moment. When I came to understand the relationship between civil rights and imperialism, they were connected subjects. So this is one of the critical things to always uh, pay attention to because, of course, for me, it was also pivotal. The following week, I got my induction papers. I uh, refused, went to jail for it. There were 38,000 refusers in the uh, 1970s that uh, occupied jails. This is something that uh, you should put on your education list if you haven't been there. It's a great university. <clears throat> I see somebody smiling about that. Uh, the United States had a significant transformation in 1973 when they abolished the draft system, the conscripted army system that occupied at that, that moment. Why that is significant is because rich people even got the papers to show up for induction. It was a class leveling situation that brought all races, all age, all demographics into the same uniform. It ended in 19, 1973, and one of the significant transformations of the United States took place in which we have an all volunteer army. Why is that important? Well. For us in the 70s, there was a clear connection between our lives and the imperialist war that was taking place in Vietnam. For those of you who uh, are thinking about being involved with the Union, I have to give you a couple cautionary historical notes. The first problem <clears throat> was our uh, leader, uh, George Meany, who had a bad habit of dabbling with our dues money and the CIA and the State Department. So please be absolutely careful of any of the institutions, particularly unions that you're involved in, that also support overseas unionist activities. To be absolutely certain that you're not supporting a government that uh, allows the execution of trade unionists. Uh, for me, the event was Salvador Allende's ascendance to 
presidency in Chile only to be completely sabotaged by various uh, FLCIO uh, sponsored supposed union democracy groups that were in fact not at all about union democracy but were about the business of co-opting various other unions. Why is this so important? Well, virtually all the employers that I deal with as a Teamster are multinational. The big event that is coming is August 1st when UPS's contract expires. And what is now different that uh, folks need to pay attention to is the rank and file strategy has perhaps run its course in the United Auto Workers and perhaps run its course with the Teamsters. In these two unions, for the first time, we have direct voting on our leadership. Well, what's the problem with this direct voting for leadership and democracy? You get involved with the union, you rise through the union, you become a steward, then you get elected to a position and you become an official. And so the first issue that you should be aware of is you better be a quality business unionist or nobody is gonna follow you to the revolution. If you don't do the grievances, don't return the phone calls and have a packed explanation of how the rank and file strategy is going to solve all of these problems, guess what? It's not going to happen successfully. So the first problem that both the UAW and the Teamsters have with change of leadership at the top is they don't have a very deep bench. They don't have individuals were out there to assume leadership positions to support a uh, changed, change, potentially changed international. Change only comes when you have all of the positions filled, not just a couple positions at the top. So please, I'm here to talk about uh, lessons from the 70s. Be very cautious about thinking that union democracy solves anything. It only creates a brand new set of problems in which people have to be multi-skilled. And <laughs> I was thinking about uh, making some snide remark, being able to pray at the altar of the National Labor Relations Board. But if you don't know how to file an unfair labor practice charge, if you don't know how to conduct yourself at a federally supervised mediation, um, if you don't know how to handle an arbitration, well then hire lawyers, step out of the business, and use your union dues to pay somebody else to look out for you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone for their opening remarks. and. Um, I would, uh, I would just want to propose that everyone um, respond to each other's comments. Maybe incorporating a little bit of the comparison being made in the prompt of the situation now and the situation in the 1970s. In the 1970s, you have the, the generation who were politicized by the movement against the Vietnam War and, and uh, the Civil Rights Movement getting involved in trade union politics with the intent of uh, transforming the unions. And currently, you seem to have uh, the DSA, which has experienced this rapid growth uh, as, a, as a consequence of, of the Trump administration, uh, looking to get serious about union work as well. So if you could find a way to, to, uh, to tie that knot for me, that would be, that would be good. So Naomi, if I could give you a chance to uh, to respond? Well, one of the books I'd recommend is uh, this one, The Turn to Industry, Forging a Proletarian Party, which um, includes a lot of the experience of the Socialist Workers Party in the period, you know, of the, uh, you know, from the mid, late 1970s through 
up, up through today, really, in, in, in work in, in industry and industrial trade unions, you know, including taking up what the, I, I mentioned in my remarks, you know, this isn't, this wasn't something, like a turn to industry wasn't some new thing for the Socialist Workers Party. It's been, you know, building that kind of party has been what we've been from, 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 from the beginning. Um, but you had in the, you know, with the mass working class led movement to defeat Jim Crow segregation and black rights struggle that exploded in the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, the Cuban Revolution, the impact of that, the impact of the, 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 the actually the, the Khrushchev revelations and the, you know, beginnings of the disintegration of world Stalinism, the political impact that had. Um, and then, you know, a little bit later, the, the, the rise of the uh, fight against the war in Vietnam and so forth. You had a whole generation of young people who um, were attracted to revolutionary working class politics, but, but did come out, you know, Many came from, from, from student movements, certainly not all of um, just thinking about people I know. Um, the, uh, but the uh, didn't view as you know sacrificing something, but, but, but this was the opportunity they were looking for to, 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 to be part of building in the trade unions and uh, uh, <coughs> The, one of the things it describes in here is the interconnection between, you know, some of the victories that had been won in the fight, you know, like to bring down Jim Crow and, and some of the union victories, like the organizing drive at the uh, big shipyards in Newport News, um, uh, which, uh, you know, were, were, was led by workers who were black who had been, you know, there, there was a deep interconnection between those battles and, and, and the fight to build and strengthen the unions. The interconnection in that period with the, the fight um, in, the, in the 1980s of farmers against the farm foreclosures and the effects of the debt crisis on farmers. Um, it's, a, it's a very rich history and experience. The, the, the fact that there's, you know, oftentimes people think today that the fact that there's a much lower rate of unionization today than, you know, than there was 40 years ago. Um, is a result of, you know, well, it just shows that this was all a mistake or a, a false promise or something. It's the effects of the, what world capitalism has been going through and the deepening crisis, it, which has been on a descent since, uh, since the mid-70s for sure. And with deepening assaults on labor, um, uh, which we, we've gone through here, here and, and, and elsewhere. Um, you know, so we're in a very different situation today. We've gone from 20% of the <coughs> private workforce being unionized to I think it's six or seven percent today. Um, the uh, um, that's why the the resistance is happening today is so important. I, I just say one thing about the uh, you know how how does change come in the unions? I mean, the kind of change I think is needed doesn't revolve around replacing the officials of the unions. It revolves around um, much more the union seeing itself. The way, the way Karl Marx talked about in, in uh, uh, 1868, in trade, that, you know, um, uh, I mean, tra he explains how trade unions um, you know, are absolutely necessary fundamental building blocks for the, you know, defensive organizations of the working class. Um, you know, it says, uh, in terms of the future, apart from their original purposes, they must now learn to act deliberately as organizing centers of the working class in the broad interest of its complete emancipation. They must aid every social and political movement in tending in that direction. They must convince the world at large that their efforts, far from being narrow and selfish, aim at the emancipation of the downtrodden millions. Well, how are you going to get there? You get there through more and more mobilizing the ranks of, you know, us, us organizing and fighting, fighting against the bosses and learning to look to ourselves and not to our officials and not to the NLRB or in the case of the rail unions, the Federal Railway Administration or any of these other uh, things. Um, how's that happen? It, ha it happens in struggle. I didn't bring up here, but out on the table we have this series of the Teamster books, Teamster Rebellion and, and three others that I strongly recommend because it's the, the, the most uh, concrete experience, I think, in the history of the American labor movement that, that, that shows the possibilities and capacities in that direction. Thank you, Naomi. Lou? 
Thanks. Um, <clears throat> what I, I think took from your question is kind of what's different, kind of what's changed. Um, and I think that's part of what this panel is trying to get at, right? And, and you know, I thought it was re really interesting, Richard, what you said, you know, perhaps the rank and file strategy has run its course in these two major unions. And so then, of course, you know, as this panel is talking about, it would be problematic if something has run its course just then to have a, a large socialist organization say, okay, we're going to take up this thing, um, which is, you know, what, what one wants to discuss. Um, I have two thoughts about that. I think one, you know, what has changed, I think one can ask what are, you know, the various forms of, of employment or unemployment that folks experience these days. So you could make a good point that, you know, uh, now is a very exciting time to really start thinking about organizing in regards to gig workers, uh, in regard to folks you know who work part-time jobs, folks who are undocumented, uh, folks who are unemployed. You know, organizing the unemployed. So you know, it's 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 a time to to, to consider these things and how they've changed. I think another point, and this is kind of my more kind of theoretical interest in a way is to also question the, the, the underlying idea of what I think, although I'd have to do, you know, maybe a little bit more looking into it, is a labor position that is influenced largely out of the Trotskyist canon. Um, and so I think, lar you know, again, I'd have to look more into it, but some ideas regarding um, the spontaneity of, of working class consciousness, um, regarding the formation of, of workers' councils, I think one has to think about what are the um, theoretical ideas uh, that are kind of packed into the strategy that um, one might one might kind of miss or one might not be so interested in taking up, but that that is something important to do now, right? You know, this is our thing to look at strategy, to look at tactics, and to really question. You know, have the things you know that we've been doing have they been working? Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> I want to address a point that Luke made and a point that Richard made on uh, the relevance of what I talked about in the 1980s and subsequently into the 90s, the student revolutionaries, is the rank and file strategy back in the day. And if you look at that experience, these were very dedicated, well-informed Marxist revolutionaries who went into these plants and, and factories, etc. And looking back, although they accomplished all the things I said they accomplished, they were less revolutionary at the end of it. And the... Um, more working class than they were in the beginning. And one of the things that I've said, and I've written a book about working class culture, um, it, there's a conservatism to it, not a political conservatism, but a kind of risk aversion. And so what an organizer has to do, community, political, workplace, is bring people into action, help bring people into action, to increase the sense of possibility. And the history is that once that sense of possibility and expectation rises, then things turn around. Um, so the rank and file strategy I see as not a complete strategy, but as part of building capacity. Building capacity for yourself as an organizer uh, as, a, as, a, as a strategist and building capacity of other people uh, around you who most good organizers that I know, they're not the leaders. They look for who has leadership, who, who do workers follow, and how can I influence that person in a more positive, uh, a, a more advanced direction, let me say. Uh, so that would be my response to you. I mean, you posed the question very nicely, rank and file or revolution, and mm -hmm. I would say there's a lot more to rank and file. Uh, 
Richard, I, um, I really like that statement about if you want to be a revolution, revolutionary in the labor movement, you first have to be a good business unionist. Uh, I believe that's true. And I believe you, before that, you have to be a good worker. That is, you have to be able to master what you're doing or people will not follow you in the, in the workplace. Um, I think that part's true. Uh, and I like the way, I've never heard anybody say it that way. Uh, because we're, there's uh, this opposition between social unionism and business unionism. And Richard and I, probably all of us here are on the social unionism side. Um, but on union democracy, Yes, it creates new problems, and yes, the auto workers and the Teamsters aren't going to be transformed, particularly the auto workers, overnight. But if you, the steel workers, the union I, that I grew up in, um, the steel workers had direct elections from the very beginning, and therefore they had a politics within the union from the very beginning. In many other ways, they're like the auto workers, except the auto workers never had that. They had one, they had like a communist party, you know, one party rule of that, uh, of that, that union. And when push came to shove in the 80s and 90s through the deindustrialization, the auto workers fell apart. They had no internal uh, life. And they got rid of the best organizer they had, Jerry Tucker in St. Louis who, if he had been leadership of that union, would have made a very big difference. Uh, the steel workers, on the other hand, survived in a way. They lost lots of steel mills and lots of, lots of fights, but they transformed themselves th partly through their democratic process and are now bi as bi about as big as they, as they once were because lots of other unions have amalgamated with the steel workers. And they developed significant fight back campaigns. And I will say, the student revolutionaries were, and some of them still are, part of that transformation in the, in the steel workers. I'm glad you liked what I had to say, Jack. <laughs> I think the long game that people have to look at with the rank and file strategy is that the rank and file strategy is a short game is that the rank and file is a minority within the union. The question that really emerges is as the rank and file strategy becomes a majority in the union, do you choose to seek office? Do you choose to, I don't say, take the reins of control of that local? Uh, what was mentioned earlier was uh, Teamsters for a Democratic Union. I've been part of that for better than 30 years. Um, and what I've got to say about that is we have had serious contract campaigns, serious internal organizing led by TDU. And the unfortunate thing is we've also had at least a dozen times where we have successfully won the entire executive board and all the officer positions of a local union, only to have them be one-term officers because they were not successful at handling the day-to-day -day aspects of the mundane grievances that have to do with drugs, alcohol, attendance, lack of productivity on the job, taking a two-hour lunch and sleeping in your truck. I mean, this is, this is what, the, what we do as truck drivers is we steal time uh, and we get caught and we have to be defended by our officers, all right? So if you can't defend me and get me my job back, I'm not ready to go to your revolutionary party. <laughs> Thanks very much. We're going to open up to questions and answers. And I would just ask everyone, in the interest of time, that we keep our questions as precise and to the point and uh, relevant as possible. So the first hand I saw was Tomas. And then I will just start 
Thank you, everyone, for great presentations. I guess when I noticed that there's a certain um, emphasis, as probably could be expected, on um, kind of economic or workshop issues, uh, and I, I think Naomi, you did bring up more of the political aspect around Trump, and I wanted to kind of tease this out, kind of the the seventies now um, and the political development since then. I mean, I think one thing you mentioned is that the um, the turn to industry is not new. So meaning, of course, the old left already dealt with this, um, but we can say that the 60s, the new left as a phenomenon was a dissatisfaction with um, the old left's maybe worker, uh, 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 what is that, I'm missing. Missing the words right now, but essentially a, a sort of economic focus, um, and 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 there was a pivot towards uh, uh, race, gender, sexuality, this sort of new social subjects, it's been called. Um, the seventies, of course, were a period of downturn for the new left, meaning it was already the kind of exhaustion of these new politics that uh, led to a rediscovery of labor struggles, as it were. Um, and one of the things, the liabilities of this is seeing class as a new form of um, I did, right? This got brought up yesterday in the Norman Finkelstein's um, book talk as well as something that's repeating now. Um, so against this kind of wokeness, identity politics, we're seeing a re-re-return to the 70s labor organizing. And I think one of the um, difficulties there is uh, reproducing class uh, labor as a constituency of the Democratic Party. Um, and so in, in the 70s, there was already a political realignment, um, I think, that culminated in the 80s moment, right? We have this phenomenon of Reagan Democrats. We have political uh, uh, instability. Um, and the same thing happened in 2016. So obviously, we have Trump and Bernie as twin phenomena. And there, too, there's a question of like, what the working class wants. And I wanted to complicate this economic kind of picture that we've gotten, I think, from all four panelists by saying, well, it's not clear, actually, what the labor unions would uh, unanimously sort of propose, right? So there's this idea of organizing the working class, sure, but then we also have to deal with the fact that the working class is itself split uh, politically, right? So it's not, I think, a straightforward proposition of supporting workers, let's say, um, or of representing workers, even, um, because I think there's yeah, complications there. I'll leave it there. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, well, first, one thing on the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party has never been the party of labor. At times, they've tried to present themselves, they, they, they try and present themselves as such and have since the Roosevelt period, more or less, but that's always been an illusion. It's the largest party of U.S. imperialism, the largest imperialist power in the world. It's always been and always will be a capitalist party, straight up. A party is defined by its program and the class it represents, not by you know, who votes for it. And so it is completely irrelevant whether workers at one point or another see the Democrats as the lesser evil, see the Republicans as the lesser evil. Today it's split pretty much between, I mean, my experience is, is there's there's opinions both way and a lot of workers don't vote for any of them because they or they or they purely say well I really hate it but I'm going to hold my nose and vote for one of them but they don't see either of them as being a party and that's one of the things that has I think the disillusionment that either of these parties can represent us it has grown in the last period it's certainly not universal and it, it's certainly you have to also have something to fight for but it's one of the things that's happened I want to mention, you know, the, the, the question of being in the, the, I think one or two people have alluded to, you know, said, you know, um, you know by going into the unions, and this may be true of, of some, some groups in the 70s that, that, that sent members into the unions, they became less political and more trade unionist. Um, that's not the point. And the point, you know, I mean, we, in, in the Socialist Workers' Party, we strive as much as possible to be competent trade unionists, uh, active builders of the unions, and of solidarity, and of strengthening the unions in that way. Um, but um, one thing I just want to very briefly cite um, Lenin in the, uh, you know, what is to be done? Let's see if I can find this. 
the uh, um, uh, to, you know, uh, well, okay, I won't try and read it, but one, one of the things Lenin points, Lenin makes in, in what is to be done, he, it's an argument against the economists and the people that uh, thought that you could organize the working class simply through the immediate struggles of the economic struggles of the working class. And he says the party needs to be a, a tribunes of the people. That's, that's where the title of this book, Tribunes of the People and the Trade Unions, comes from, the interrelationship between them. And he wasn't degrading. He, said, he says you can't just be a trade union secretary. And by doing that, he wasn't degrading trade union secretaries, people that carry out the, the necessary organization to fight for the demands of you know, day-to-day -day demands in, in the workplace. So he says the party also needs to organize, you know, and publicize and, and, and win people around all, every single manifestation of the fight against oppression uh, and exploitation and draw the connections between those struggles. Um, the, the Socialist Workers' Party has never seen what we're doing in the trade unions or our work in, 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 in the trade unions or anything else as being counterposed to or things. We, to, 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 to these broadest political questions. There is no monolithic view within the working class, and we don't expect there to be, and there never will be. Um, you know, we take all of those questions both into the unions, or, you know, but not at, at, at the same, you can have political discussion and debate around all these questions, and at the same time stand together in the union struggles. Um, they're not counterposed to each other, and that's, that's not what we do. Um, and, and you s finally, you just you did see experiences like you know in the in the 1979 there was the revolution in Nicaragua, uh, there was other revolutionary developments in the, there was a revolution in Grenada, um, you know that both of which brought workers and farmers governments to power for a period of time. Neither both for various reasons were eventually defeated, but. You know, there was a rising movement against apartheid in South Africa. All of these things we brought into, the, and there was significant union involvement in, in, in different ones of these struggles they, that, that helped to politically educate and, and broaden experiences. We were part of all of that. Um, and, and there will be others today. What, well, you know, other struggles like that in the future. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. Does anyone else want uh, to respond to Tomas's question uh, about? Um, the renewed interest in class politics reconstituting the base of the Democratic Party? Jack? There's a lot of questions, so I'd, I'd, can you hear me? Yeah. There's a lot of questions, so I'd like to hear uh, more. But the identity movements that the, the brother, uh, race, gender, queer, today, they have been successful. So as the working class movement has deteriorated in the last 40 years, there's real progress on all of three of those fronts. But that progress is stymied now be with, because of the absence of class. And in each case, class, is a, class and the working class, which is a majority, no matter, a large majority, about two-thirds, no matter how you define it, um, those class issues have to be addressed, and uh, so I appreciate you know the, the and I've always been focused on the economic and and class etc. Um, but those other movements are running aground with because of the absence of class and class consciousness uh, within them. They become middle class movements for the most part. It's okay to respond. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think there are opportunities to bring in, and it's very important, you know, to bring in the the political element. Um, one thing I'm thinking about, just in, is in regards to the the railway workers in in East Palestine. Um, I think that is an example of um, <clears throat> bringing in not only the importance of having. Um, political representatives or people in various kind of high profile positions who can take a principled stance that reflects the interests of the working class and reflects the interests of the organization that they're a part of. Um, so the best example of this then of course is in the negative in the case of the DSA 
when you know folks attach the DSA, say for one, don't take that perspective. Um, so it 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 opens up the possibility for um, the power of politicizing political struggles um, and the absolute necessity of doing that, and then at the same time the absolute necessity of building up. Um, programs and structures that will facilitate that um, because quite frankly you know if you have an organization and a politician can be a part of that organization but they can just you know do what they want then you know it's not very effective but that then doesn't mean that the whole project itself is bunk so to speak it just means that there's more to do there um, and that the political realm can be used in that way and historically has been used very effectively uh, by the socialist movement. So we're going to take some more questions. Um, is it on now? Is it on? No. Okay. Is it is it on? Yes. All right. All right. Um, what I just generally what I noticed about the panel in terms of like basically everyone participating on it except Luke is a sort of hesitancy to like advocate for socialism in the workplace, a kind of econ general economism um, that seems to be like kind of reoccurring in the way they talk, uh, the way they sort of like talk about these, uh, sort of like the union question and uh, the rank and file like sort of strategy. Um, on on the right with our two, two gentlemen, um, <laughs> we, have, we have them talking of good deeds and uh, sort of like just the sort of basic functioning of the unions without any kind of like long-term overarching goal of socialism or anything like that and it, you know it, it, that that kind of politics seems like a dead end in the current moment really given the decline in the standards of living and all that um and with naomi uh, like obvious she's more political more politically inclined but even even with her, there's still kind of like the economism going, uh, kind of underlying economism, in the sense that there's a hesitancy to advocate for socialism in the workplace. The main enemy is ultimately the boss, but all there's uh, sort of ignoring like how much the unions end up collaborating with the capitalist class, the bosses overall. Um, how much that collaboration is like sort of there and like really an important like sort of function of unions in the United States currently and the Western world in general. And it 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 kind of like with that in mind it kind of like leads leads me to like question like the sort of like utility of like advocating for a labor party made up of business unions that are hostile to the interests of the working class and um, you know we, we see like a real track record of like labor la labor parties like not leading to any kind of like so strong socialist revolutionary socialist movement so I, I guess I'm gonna go and ask Naomi, why would you want, want a labor? Why should we have aim for creating a labor party in the United States when, the, when labor parties across the world have a consistent track record of becoming reformists to the point of not even having any kind of meaningful socialist politics? That gets both questions in the chat too. So. Okay. Um, the, uh, is that on? It should be. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, uh, well, we don't advocate a reformist labor party. We advocate a class part that the working class needs its own party. We need to start with a class break from the Democrats and the Republicans 
and any other bourgeois parties, like the Green Party and the Libertarian Party are, are bourgeois parties that function as pressure groups on, on them. And you could easily see in the coming years a possibility of a split in the Democrats or the Republicans that would think. We think the, the working class needs our, our own party. We would, we, we would fight within that for a, you know, for, for, for a program to best advance the interests of the working class. Uh, we don't, you know, uh, but we start with the class break. I, I would strongly recommend a book out there called Teamster Politics, which deals with the time in U.S. history where I think we came closest to the possibilities for a labor party. It's when you had the mass movement. Well, let me step back a second. You're not going to get a labor party based on the unions as they exist today. We advocate that, but we raise it because it, it helps to understand the idea of where we need to go. The only time you're going to get a labor party in this country is you'd have to have enough of a rise in the labor movement that you have fighting unions, at least in the scale of what you had in the 1930s, um, that showed the possibilities um, and, you know, of starting to organize not only on the economic level, but also on the political level, which is absolutely necessary. We're not going to resolve anything just on the economic level. Um, you know, and revolutionary, you know, communists would fight, fight within that for, 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 for a, a, a program that meets the, 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 the interests of, of the working class. Um, the, uh, um, that, that possibility was totally stymied in, um, in the 1930s by a combination of, of uh, the, uh, uh, some of the uh, 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 officials of, of, the, of the CIO unions and the uh, Communist Party, which, which channeled everything into backing Roosevelt. With the exception of at a certain point, John L. Lewis got fed up enough with Roosevelt uh, that he said, we're going to break, da, 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 da. everybody thought he was going to call for a labor party, and he endorsed the Republican. And it was a total betrayal of the possibility at that point, which, which there was at that point, of, of organizing that. But, uh, you know, when we talk about labor party, and we make clear we're not the labor, like the labor party of, you know, in the UK, or the labor party in you know, a number of other countries like New Zealand, which came out of mass labor struggles and started out as real parties of, of labor, but have, you know, long since degenerated into parties that are, um, yeah, the, the Labor Party in the UK is, is certainly, um, you know, pretty much the equivalent of the Democratic Party in the United States. It's, it's not, uh, it's a purely capitalist party today. Um, but I, I'm curious what you think advocating socialism, anyway, we, we can talk about it, but, you know, wh what do you mean by advocating socialism in the workplace? You know, what we talk to our coworkers about is why the working class needs to, to become the ruling class in society. And we talk about all the different struggles that are going on. We're also... Ad, strong advocates of organizing and using our union power and, and starting to organize, use our power as workers. One of the discussions that I've had many, many times over the last year is, okay, I just kind of wrap up on this real quick. You know, the, the, the question of can we go on strike? Real workers can't go on strike because it's not legal. I said, no, we can't. It's not that we can't go on strike because it's not legal to go on strike. And so we're up against the government as well as the bosses. And why that, that shows it's a government of the bosses. Um, if that's not part of having the, if that's economism as opposed to trying to discuss starting from the real existing conditions and questions that workers are facing, where we need to go, then I don't know what is. Um, if, if Richard or, or Jack wants to get in on this too, you stay on the I'll get in for, for 30 seconds. <laughs> I'm not sure uh, which uh, form of uh, Baskin Robbins I uh, like the most. You know, <laughs> we have 33 flavors, and of course, I don't want to get into the economics of whether it's going to be state control of the enterprises of production, or whether it's going to be worker cooperatives that are the uh, control of property. So the uh, fundamental problem that I haven't quite figured out uh, for today's forum is uh, which brand of socialism we're uh, marketing. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I'm here to entertain a little bit. <laughs> Cam, if we could have a bunch of questions. Uh, yeah, there are more questions out here. I'd like to get some. So the current stack I have right now, I have a Brian, Pam, Addison, and then we can, we can keep them. Moderator has the stack. Yeah. Um, thanks.
thanks very much to speak. The question back to the 70s is not really, or not primarily one of strategy or advice to would-be proletarianizing students who, whose happiness may be subject to other fates. Um, it's really a question of historical memory. And I think that started coming up on the panel with Naomi referring to the Teamsters in the 30s or this question of like, what is socialism? And, you know, those student radicals, when they went into uh, labor unions in the 70s, what they discovered were old time communists, um, who, uh, you know, at least in Britain, who had powerful positions in the trade unions. And they struggled with how to relate to that. And they went in with certain ideas about how to kind of revive the 20s and 30s against the, what they considered the degeneration or the betrayal or the whatever of those old communist guys. Um, but they also were forced to reconsider that history by their confrontation in those situations with those older guys who said to them, you're not serious, we know how to really do the work. Um, so I want to know from the people who were there in the 70s, what was the memory of the 20s and 30s when you were around in the 70s? It, does, it, like, does it sound similar to what Naomi's saying about the Teamsters, or does you not recognize that? And how was that memory kind of wrestled with by young people who were dealing with labor union issues then, right? The memory from the 20s and 30s. And for the speakers who weren't around in the 70s, how do you think about that problem that the historical memory is of that you're trying to raise, like through Kim Moody's experience, is already compounded by this problem of the 20s and 30s and how he would have received that. Before we move on to the stack, I would actually like to hear hear an answer to that question because it's, it does seem to speak to a lot of the themes of this panel. In particular, um, you know, Naomi has cited Feral Dobbs, uh, a past leader of her party, and Richard, I think Feral Dobbs would also be uh, someone that you would have thought about uh, in your time in Teamsters for a Democratic Union. So if, if you guys, uh, you don't all need to get in on this, but I, I would certainly like to hear uh, and maybe um, if we could start with Richard. <clears throat> in Minneapolis, uh, there were a uh, group of uh, men who worked in the uh, coal yards as coal delivery folks. Uh, most people think of the Teamsters as being a uh, broad industrial kind of thing. The fact of the matter is we're an amalgamation of craft unions. And when we say craft unions, we were the coal haulers and ice haulers. Coal in the winter, ice in the summer. A different local handled milk, a different local were material handlers that carried the lumber. I, when they mentioned Farrell Dobbs, <clears throat> he was part of a core group of largely what I would describe as Trotskyist inclined uh, leftists who sat and did massive internal education to the level that uh, the credibility was such that, and now we're going to get to something that hasn't been discussed. When it was decided, this is this problem of when you're a minority or when you reach the majority status, the majority status of the coal haulers said, we are striking for better wages and shorter working hours. What this led to, this economic situation of striking for better wages and shorter hours, then turned into a mass movement. And so what was existent at that time were a number of struggling local unions who saw the model that was used with internal education uh, and shameless, I will say, discussion of what was called the class war. The class war was not a party. People got shot, people carried guns to the picket line, people carried baseball bats. The employers formed a voluntary uh, Employers Law and Order Association that came with guns, 
Uh, this is not, this is the actual reality of it. But the important thing that I want to talk about that time period was that there was an unembarrassed discussion of the class war. Thank you. I, I just say, in answer to the question about memory in the 70s, um, in my generation and the people I experienced, the 30s particularly, not the 20s, but the 30s and the early turn of the century, of uh, the, the 20th century, those were inspirations as we learned about them. Um, how? In what way? How? Uh, in that there were struggles, particularly in the 30s, that were victorious. The sit-down strike at Flint, primarily, but those the, the development of the CIO and the, the battling with the Iron and Coal Police, etc., um, those were parts of our history, of U.S. history, that we didn't know about. We, you know, I, I was not, but most of them were uh, middle-class kids um, and had, you know, had very little experience of working-class life. And uh, so this was a whole new uh, development in the midst of the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, then the women's movement, then queer movement. You know, they, there was this trajectory where discovering that history gave many of us a anchor uh, to, move, to move forward in our own politics. Preceding Flint, you had to be in Akron, Ohio. The very first sit-down strikes took place in Akron, Ohio. And those were the tire builders who sent those tires to Flint to be put on the vehicles. Critical to the success of that was when the uh, rubber companies put sandbags and machine guns on the roofs of BF Goodrich, Firestone, Goodyear, Cyberling, uh, tire and rubber, um, was that we had a Thanksgiving Day march where over 40,000 men and women took guns and marched on Main Street in Akron, Ohio. My father admitted to carrying a small 22 revolver. Well, I just like to uh, to make a kind of, uh, some of the uh, some of the struggles. One of the one of the struggles going into the 1970s that had a tr you know a transforming effect on you know one of the major unions was the fight in the United Mine Workers, where you know it. I, I think it's instructive. I mean, the mi coal miners in this country, you know, and, and and many other places, partly because of the dangers of the job, have you know a long history of organizing and of bloody battles to organize the unions in the early early part of the 20th century. Um, uh, and and in subsequent, they, they, it was the coal miners that, that that stood up and went on strike against the no strike laws in the, during World War II. You know when there was supposedly a wage price freeze and they froze the wages but not the prices, and the miners went on a strike. I talked to coworkers about this a lot because they it was not legal for them to it was illegal for them to strike. They said, well, you want to try mining the coal with bayonets, and they won. They they push it back. It shows some of the power that we're capable of. But you know, by the 1960s, the the, the, the the miners' union was dominated by labor bureaucracy that completely, um, you know, subservient to the coal bosses and stuff. And it was in the course of fighting against the conditions they were facing, the deaths in the mines, the the deaths from mine explosions, from black lung disease, and so forth, that you had a struggle that developed in the miners' union uh, that. Um, uh, you know, fought, you know, for, you know, for a union that would actually, you know, stand up to these conditions um, and, and built social movements in the coal fields that one not just, you know, uh, push back, one forcing the coal bosses to, to, to address the conditions that were leading to deaths from black lung, but also won health clinics that affected whole regions of the country, um, providing medical care for entire communities, a lot of which are being shut down now, of course. Um, 
but you know, it, and in, in the course of that, changed the, the leadership of the union and forged what for a while was the strongest union in the United States by far and could actually enforce safety on the job where if the conditions weren't safe, they would simply walk off the job. Um, which, you know, is, is, is an element of workers' control. Of, I, I'm raising this because it, it's, there, there's a lot, there's important examples that we can draw on from this history that show what we're capable of. And this is, you know, part of what we need to understand the confidence of, of what the working class is capable of. Um, the, uh, and that, that, that's the big, one of the biggest challenges we face in the working class today is the, the lack of self-confidence. But, but I think through these experiences, it is very important to learn our history. Because through the history, and through positive and negative experiences, and their history as part of an international class and connected with the broadest questions of war, of you know, revolutions, and so forth, um, you know, that we can see how to, you know, what we're capable and what, what the future has to be. The, what, the only way forward for humanity is for the working class to take power. As long as, this, long as these <coughs> capitalists remain in power, they are going to continue to produce and reproduce these conditions. And we'll win battles and then we'll get pushed back again until we're able to do that. Can I, can I ask another oh. Thanks. Um, very provocative question. One thing that just kind of came to mind. Um, and I could be wrong about this, so you know someone could check me. I think you know when the the um, rank and file strategy was kind of formally adopted, you know, in the in the DSA by a vote. From what I understand, it was a con it was a relatively contested vote, you know, by uh, in terms of vote counts that you hear sometimes. You know, it wasn't like, you know, seven hundred and fifty delegates to two hundred and fifty delegates. It was, you know, there was a smaller margin, but that there wasn't a lot of. I wasn't there at the time, but reports I've read there. But there, despite that contested vote, there wasn't a lot of discussion, uh, which seems kind of strange. I don't know. That it almost seems to speak to maybe there's some uh, there's some understanding, right? The pe people are people have an opinion about this, but there's not. I don't know. Not an ability to talk about what's going on, or not a willingness to talk about what's going on. Because that's what you want to see. You want to see tight votes. That's that's great. But then you want to see a lot of discussion about what is the thing that's being put into place, which is about you know what this is all about. And you know the obvious answer then for me it's just the importance of political education, um, and that a lot of what you see you know not just in in the DSA, but in, in a lot of groups, I think, you know, you get young folks in, the world's really exciting, you really want to do something, there's, you know, it's always urgent, there's always a disaster on the horizon, so then you get thrown in and you start doing things. Um, and then you, and you do and you do and you do, but you never really stop and kind of reflect in a certain sense. Um, so that is just absolutely crucial, and it doesn't have to kind of paralyze you, it doesn't have to mean you stop acting. Um, but too often, I mean, you know, the politics I experienced, you know, too, too often, you get really excited. You find yourself ch chanting things and saying things, and you look back and you go, oh my God, you know, I said that. But it was really exciting. You know, I, you know it's, it's an exciting time. But to stop and reflect and, and, and read, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing to, to read and to study. Uh, yeah. So please formulate your questions in advance, and we've got time to get through them. And if yours is more of a comment, please send it to our journal, The Platypus Review. <laughs> Hi. So I'm going to ask uh, three questions. I will try to keep it brief. Did and does one have to be a worker to understand working class consciousness? Did and does being a worker in a key industry necessarily engender an understanding of class consciousness? And entailed in all of this, if we're looking back to the 1970s and the turn to industry, what about the turn to the academe? What about the long march to the institutions? Thank you. Do any of you guys want in on that immediately, or uh, do you want to take one more question, and then, then we can... Uh, yes, yes, and maybe. Yes, yes, and maybe. <laughs> can, you, can you unpack that a little bit? Um, microphone, microphone. Just, no, you don't have to be a worker to have class consciousness, and I wish that the professional middle class 
had more class consciousness of who we are and the role we play in this society and our relationship to the working class. Um, on the long march through the institutions in the academy, um, I think we've been more successful there, and that's where I was, um, <clears throat> than, we were, than we have been in the workplace, unfortunately. Being in a uh, key industry is, or a key work position, is always uh, very problematic because of the aristocracy of labor within the labor movement, uh, within our uh, UPS facilities. We have the guys who drive the tractor trailers, the big pulling three trailers, they're in the 150,000 a year club. We have at the far other end of the spectrum, we have the part-timers loading those trucks who are lucky to make 30,000 a year. So uh, the key folks are those trucks. We control it, we get the money that way. That is so class biased that we are so special to get that money. So be careful about uh, the value of a special position. Um, what's more interesting, uh, you know, about that question to me, I think actually though, is, is what is class consciousness, um, which is great too, because then I get to say the name of the, you know, the name of the event in my speech. It's like when you say the name of a movie, you know, in the movie. Um, but but seriously, it's like you know, we talk about class consciousness and class consciousness developing, you know, in the workplace. But what is, you know, when when Lenin talks about class consciousness, what is class consciousness? Um, so, you know, I'll take a stab. I think class consciousness, it's, you know, it's, it's the necessity of taking state power. You know, I'll, I'll throw it out there. So then if class consciousness is the necessity of taking state power, then does the working class come to that realization through the rank and file strategy as outlined by Kim Moody alone? And I'd say no. <clears throat> I mean, I agree be, with that. being a worker, does, workers are conscious that they're workers. Um, the uh, being conscious of, of of our class possibilities, you know, the fact that you know our capacities to become the ruling class in society and the necessity of that. No, that doesn't come. It doesn't. Come, and it's not. It doesn't come simply from 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 being told it either. You know, you can't. It's not an intellectual exercise. It'll. It comes by degrees in different ways through concrete concrete experiences. Um, yes, it's possible for somebody who's not a worker to, 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 to become conscious of the class positions in society, but to really be a working class revolution, you have to come over entirely to the side of the working class, you know, uh, in terms of your functioning and politics. People like Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, other did 100%. Many, many others don't, and that's most of what you've got in academia today. And um, I mean, most of what you have in academia is a, you know, is a, a meritocracy who view themselves as being smarter than the working class, and that's true of the left of the meritocracy as much as of the right of the meritocracy. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to return to this question of historical memory um, that that front raised. So one of the things that Naomi talked about. Um, so you, you don't depend on the National Labor Review Board. Uh, the working class was organized independently. And then she raised the Minneapolis trucker strike of 1934. And I just wanted to know what were the lessons, um, what were the actual lessons of the Communist League of America in that moment in the way in which the defensive position of the unions relates to the offensive position of the party um, in order to take state power, right? Like what's the relationship that that moment showed? What were the lessons in the founding moment of the SWP and what were the lessons now? And my second question is um, something that Jack raised, which you said that one of the things that the rank and file strategy um, taught us was that the objective conditions can be changed by organizing working class people for collective action. Um, and it seems like the first two presentations raise the issue of waiting for a crisis of capitalism to come and then to rise to the occasion. 
but you seem to suggest, or at least your comments seem to suggest, that the organizing of the working class itself is part of the objective condition. And I wanted you to elaborate on what you meant by that. Thanks. Um, the uh, well, one of the one of the lessons that many many workers learned during the Minneapolis uh, strikes in 1934 and in the period after, you know, of the the, the building on those fights to, to 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 unionize throughout, you know, in other industries in Minneapolis and then beyond, um, was you know basic questions of of the uh, of. Uh, you know, that you can't rely on government mediators, government, you know, things. They're not neutral. They're on the side of the bosses. Learn to rely on your own power. Those are basic lessons of class, con growing class consciousness that were learned. Um, many, of the, many of the leaders of that fight were conscious revolutionaries with trade union experience going back further than that. Um, in the course of that fight, a, a, a small but a significant number of workers were one to a much broader consciousness and, and, and if you go back and re find the, uh, the, the, the Northwest Organizer, the union newspaper published at that time, it did take up broader questions in the interest of the working class, including starting to campaign, you know, explain why it was not in the interest of workers here, the, 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 the war preparations that were being made by the Roosevelt administration. That's one of the reasons that both the the, that the Roosevelt administration, with support from the top leadership of the Teamsters Union, uh, cracked down and ultimately sent leaders of the Teamsters Union and of the uh, Socialist Workers Party to prison during World War II. Um, but the, I'm not quite sure I understood your, your question about the, the if you read the, 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 the series by Farrell Dobbs, he, it, it, you understand in it both a lot about what it takes to build, build militant fighting unions and you know, you, you hardly see the party in it, but the party's totally involved in it and, and, and the kind of political course and how in the course of struggle workers consciousness of, of, of their self their capacities, their their self confidence and, and their political consciousness can grow in the course of a militant struggle uh, against the bosses. So I don't know. I think if I if I could just actually follow up on that, I, I think that the, the the core of Pimp's question is was the the party, the Communist League of America in this case, necessary in that strike battle and for the victory of that strike battle. And a similar thing would apply with the to the auto light strike you talked about in Toledo, with the American Workers Party who were instrumental in that in that strike Richard. So what is the role of of, of a socialist political party? in facilitating and winning strike action and labor organizing. We can take another question, but maybe that's just something to kind of uh, to, to chew on a little bit while you, while you answer that. So this is a question for Naomi. Um, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, there are two kind of big changes in the Socialist Workers Party. One we've already talked about, you know, the tech industry, this attempt to sort of reconfigure the class composition of the party. Um, but there's also the sort of the renunciation of Trotskyism, uh, right? In, in Jack Barnes' book, Their Trotsky Arms, right? There's a rejection of the Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution. Uh, in favor of fighting for a workers and farmers government in the vein of Lenin's democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry. And my question is, is there a connection between these two changes happening around the same time in this moment? Is there something about this historical moment that sort of necessitates both of these changes in the party? Ethan's just going to take one more question, and then we can uh, we can get to that. Um, so my name is Michael, and uh, I have a question about you know why the labor plan in the first place because. It seems to me that this whole thing that we've been talking about the working class, as if it is specifically like the proletariat, 
without really like recognizing that within the working class there is like that fracturing of like class strands within the working class that make them in a, themselves like not very not very coherent in what exactly the working class wants because we're talking as if the working class as a whole has a singular identity in which they all like agree or all have this same goal like do they all want socialism or do they all want these specific things that we're talking about but that that's not exactly the case and so if we've like we're making all these arguments about the working class, about working class consciousness, why the Labour Party is great and useful, but it's not exactly, or not even, like, a question was asked about the Labour Party pointing beyond socialism, and then we all of a sudden had brands of socialism, which was not exactly like a thing that, I think, like, well, between Rosa, Luxembourg, and Lenin, like, I don't remember like, there being like brands of socialism, and so my question is, if we can't really have a coherent answer into is the Labour Party itself pointing towards socialism, um, what exactly are, can we say that historically, perhaps now, the Labour Party is not the answer into approaching socialism at all in general, and so therefore, maybe that's that's not like a position, or that's not exactly like a tool that the left can use specifically to approach that. And I think that's a good question that it's been shifting around, kind of trying to go through like redefinitions, et cetera, throughout the panel. Um, um, I would like if Roy could answer some of Addison's question, because he was actually part of that process in the 70s and early 80s. Yeah, OK, Roy, um, can you uh, keep it as, uh, as short as possible? <laughs> <laughs> It, it. Because I'm saying that because I know it's a it's a, a it, it, long it, it, episode that has a whole book. Okay, well, I, would, I would say that. Well, first first of all, that the, 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 an earlier point about the proletarianisation and, and the turn to industry, and I think the word that a friend here was looking for was workers. Um, we were, I was in the Communist League in Australia, we were advised that if we take the turn to industry, we'll become workers. We'll, we'll abandon our political program. And in fact, the opposite happened. Our movement, a and, and, and sister party the social, led by the Socialist Workers' Party, um, the central leadership and continuity going back to um, Kevin and Trotsky um, and the, the Russian Revolution, um, became more communist. Uh, and, and, that was shown in campaigns against uh, the, the, in, the campaign against imperialism in the war during the Iraq invasion. Okay, so my answer to this, this uh, question is that that's that's the connection that um, and, and, and the that Trotsky and ours is about the confidence of a turn party to develop a political program. And it's based on, I mean, it, com it comes out of what Trotsky himself wrote at, at various times. This is a complicated question. It was the young Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution that got elevated into a schema and translated different times into a kind of ultra-left sectarian approach, whereas, but it was a revolutionary uh, position. Um, and Lenin's and the Bolsheviks' approach don't think about the democratic dictatorship of the proletarian peasantry. Think about the whole program of the Bolsheviks and the, tr the transitional way that they approached um, the peasantry as a whole to carry out the, the, the war in the countryside in conjunction with the, the working class against Tsarism. And in answer to the question up the back, Lenin made the point that it was the, the industrial heartlands in St. Petersburg and Moscow that actually drew around them wider layers of the working class. The Bolsheviks were in a minority in the Soviets until right up to the point of, of the October Revolution. And that's why all the bourgeois opponents and the Menshevik opponents and all others say this was a coup. Well, it wasn't because of the, of the, of the shifts that took place um, and that were registered in the, in the Soviets. Okay, so um, the, the Socialist Workers' Party didn't, uh, I forget what the term you used, but didn't, I mean, we no longer call ourselves Trotskyists. But we think that Leon Trotsky was a communist, that we're communists, and that after Lenin's death, he was the most capable, clear, class-conscious communist leader of the, uh, to fight to continue Lenin's proletarian internationalist course on. 
you know, all across the board, um, including the, 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 the founding of the Fourth International and the last 10 years of his life were actually the most valuable in that. But, and, and if you read something like um, Leon Trotsky on China, he went back and forth on some of these questions. You know, but anyway, that's to do with the intricacies of the, um, the left opposition. But anyway, I hope, um, I mean, the, 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 the gist of it is, yes, there is a connection, and it's because the proletarian party is confident of, of developing its, its program. Thanks, Roy. We are running short on time, and we have some questions that have been asked that haven't really, uh, our panelists haven't had a chance to answer to. Um, specifically, there's the, the question of the Labour Party has recurred. Uh, you know, this is something uh, Naomi has had the chance to talk about. I was curious if uh, Luke or Jack or Richard wanted to weigh in on that, maybe with some of the historical examples that attempts towards independent labour action in the United States and the, the results of those experiments. Um, yeah, and then, you know, there's the, the returning question of the what is the relationship of the party and the union. So because of our shortage on time, unfortunately we can't get to everyone's questions. Um, we can obviously continue the discussion afterwards and throughout the rest of the convention and then in print in our forum in print, which is the bottomless review. But as it stands now, I'm going to give our panelists the task of answering those last couple of questions and trying to kind of sum up their remarks for the day so we can finish on time and have time for a break. Does anyone want to go first? I know I've made it sound good. <laughs> sure, um, I'm happy to go first. Um, I'll maybe answer one of the questions and then kind of sum up. Um, I think it's a very provocative question to ask what is, you know, the, the relationship between a socialist movement and like an organized uh, fighting working class um, and, you know, what is the relationship between <clears throat> the socialist party and, and the organized fighting working class. Um, and. You know, what I've come to at, at, at this point at least is that I do think there is a certain sense in which if you were to say, you know, I am uh, a socialist, um, you know, kind of picking and choosing what you're going to do. Um, and it's difficult perhaps in a period of time when the working class doesn't really seem to be doesn't really seem to be fighting in the ways that we can we, we know that it's capable of doing you know we, we've talked about these different historical examples um, so you know I immediately then think about you know this idea of, of the merger formula in a sense being like well you know the the socialist uh, theoreticians and whatnot often you know kind of declassed you know younger intellectuals or something coming together with the advanced, you know, fighting elements of the working class, and it's through those two, it's through the meeting of those kind of two great forces that one gets the socialist movement. So then the question is then, you know, what happens if, you know, one or both of those kind of great forces, uh, you know, appear to be kind of weak, uh, if they're both weak, if one seems to be kind of ahead of the other, if it seems like they're gonna kind of miss each other, if they're not even oriented towards each other. I mean, these are the questions that, you know, Lenin is really is really trying to grapple with, and I, and I think they still apply. Um, so then, what is the task of the socialist movement? Is it to go in and, and, and revive that layer, or is it to continue to kind of orient to uh, the layer that, that is fighting? Um, and then I'll just kind of wrap up. I, I, the two points I kind of want to hit on well, one point I want to hit on, and then kind of my promised caveat that I said I'd return to way back in the beginning. You know, this idea of, of, a, of a transition, Kim Moody in, in, in his document is talking about creating um, an ocean, as he says it, that kind of, uh, I think he uses the word ocean, an ocean that kind of socialist ideas can swim within, right? If you don't first create the conditions for the ideas to enter, then the ideas themselves are just going to go kaputs in a way. But the question is, when do you ever make that transition, right? 
And I thought it was really interesting how you said, you know, the, the, these folks go into the organizations with a lot of these ideas, and then they leave different people in a certain sense. Um, and so I, I think that's a really interesting question, how one can say, I, I have these intentions when I begin something, and pretty soon I'm, 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 I'm going to do the thing, right? The DSA is going to split with the Democratic Party. We're going to do the thing at some point. Um, you know, we're going to talk about socialism, I don't know, in the workplace at some point, once the, once the conditions are correct. You know, I, I appreciate how it's not as easy as just saying the thing and then the magic word happens, but then I also appreciate the danger of, you know, when does the correct time come? And then my last point, this caveat, it's a small thing. Debates around labor strategy, the rank and file, they need to happen in the socialist movement, right? These things need to be happen. And so I'll just you know make my little mug plug, I suppose, in a way. We came up with a labor strategy. We voted on it as a group. So a lot of people disagreed. Enough didn't disagree that it got passed, right? So in that sense, there is a mug take on the rank and file strategy, right? There's a published document that we published online for the public, anyone to see and comment on. We encourage that. So in that sense, there is. On the other sense, there's not, because we're because because we strive for democracy. So that debate needs to happen, and it doesn't happen enough, right? Around what are we doing in our labor strategy? What strategy are we using? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm a socialist. I would call myself an independent socialist. Um, but I see socialism not as something, the goal. I see it as a means toward bettering people's lives. So if your only commitment is to revolution, revolutionary socialism, I need you to tell me, what's your vision? Um, the state owns everything. Uh, there's one communist party. You know. We've had some experiments over the last hundred years that haven't gone that well, all told, for how people, by people's lives. So for me, I've kind of given up on the bigger questions. Um, I'm pretty old, so that could be why. Um, but it, what's important is organizing. And that is doing the next thing, yes, reflect from time to time. But that next thing should make lots of people's lives better, whether it's uh, in union activity, improving a contract, uh, or in electoral politics, uh, getting a family medical leave or a, a, a child tax credit. These are things that concretely improve people's lives and, if done through struggle, can improve their sense of possibility. Um, and if we do that, maybe there's socialism out there somewhere. But meanwhile, all the things I've just talked about are socialism um, as a means, not as an end. <clears throat> This year, we will probably have more strikes taking place than in the last 15 or 20 years. We have a economic crisis of depth that you folks may not fully appreciate with the outrageous inflation that's taking place. Uh, it's time that you go join those workplaces and get yourself strike ready because we will be out on the street in August. Thank you. The uh, well, in response to you know a couple of things that have come up, I, there are there is a lot of differentiation, different layers in the working class. Um, you know, and that's one of the. One of the things, you know, the socialists, where I haven't talked about this aspect of our, our work, but we, we run candidates in the elections uh, in order to, to, to put forward, a, you know, a working class perspective and, and, and talk about why we need a class break from the Democrats and Republicans. A couple of the things that we campaign.
kicking around a lot are what we what kind of fight we need to organize in the working class to address some of those divisions. For instance, the fight for jobs. I mean, one of the biggest divisions is between the employed and the unemployed. Right now you have, they say it's real low unemployment, but that's because they, so many people they don't even count as being unemployed. And then you add to that the part-time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, uh, um, so the fight, you know, why we think labor needs to fight for, for uh, government-funded public works programs to put people to work. Why we need to fight for a shorter work week with no cut in pay. You know, to spread work jobs around, take it out of the boss's profits. It's stuff that starts to get at, it, it's stuff that you'll only win through a struggle and, and, and um, starts to uh, encroach on the prerogatives of capital. Why we need to fight for amnesty for immigrant workers that are here to, 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 to cut across the way they try and pit immigrant against non-immigrant workers. Anyway, I won't go into a lot more on that, but it is part of the thing that we need to, to take up is the divisions in the working class, and, and, and that's part of it. And as part of our campaigns, one of the things we raise is the question of the Labor Party. Right now, in the absence of a much bigger labor movement, it's, it's primarily a propaganda point at this point. When there's a much bigger, broader labor movement, like I was describing in the, during the CIO movement, it can become, you know, you know something different, right? But it, it's to pose the question of why we need to break from the Democrats and the Republicans. And we don't, and we don't say it has to be that, that, that we have to win you know, millions of workers in this country to vote for the Socialist Workers Party before we make that class break. Um, that's what the, the Labor Party is, is about. And then within that, of course, communists fight, fight for a, a program that best advances the interests of the working class, which is you know, and I'm sure it would be, will be a discussion, debate, and fight. But, okay, I'll stop. I'd like to thank all our panelists very